so we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome. Uh, I'd like to call the Tuesday, January 28th, 2020 meeting of the Parks Advisory Commission to order at 4 p.m. Exactly. Um, Colin, can you please call the roll? Commissioner Gallardi. Here. Commissioner Morrison. Here. Commissioner Borgsdorf. Here. Commissioner Ramaswamy. Here. Commissioner London. Here. Commissioner Apple. Commissioner Kraut. Commissioner Skylas. Here. You have a quorum. Great. Thank you, Colin. Yeah. Um, you'll see before you the agenda. Are there any changes or additions to the agenda? Okay. Seeing none, moving on to our first public comment. If there are any members of the public who would like to speak, you're welcome to step forward. You have three minutes. Seeing no one right now, uh, we'll move on. There is another opportunity at the end of the meeting. Item five, approval of minutes of previous meetings. Uh, in your packet, you have the minutes of the November 19th, 2019 Parks Advisory Commission. Is there any discussion on those minutes or a motion to approve? I motion to approve. Motion by Bob. And then I'll second. Seconded by Rachel. Thank you. Any further comment? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Great, thank you. The minutes are approved. Item six, presentations. First up, uh, we have Dave Borneman, Scott Spooner, and Mike Hahn here from the city to present to us the integrated pest management for the city of Ann Arbor parks and natural areas. So welcome. Thank you, good to be here. I'm Dave Borneman. Uh, Scott Spooner is over there and Michael Hahn over there. Um, I'm going to run through the slides, and then if you have questions, they can help answer some of those as well. This is a presentation that we gave uh, last in December to the Environmental Commission uh, at their request to hear about our integrated pest management program in the city. We thought since we already had a presentation together, we'd go ahead and, and show you guys as well. You uh, probably, unlike the Environmental Commission, have a little bit better sense of our parks and know how diverse we are with lots of nature areas and golf courses and playgrounds and other recreational facilities, we use IPM or integrated pest management in one form or another through all those areas. Since we're talking about pest management, let's first define what a pest is. For us, a pest is any noxious or invasive plant, problem insect, plant disease, rodent, nematode, or microorganism that is detrimental to the environment or the management plan for the selected park or facility. And then what is IPM? This is my most text-heavy slide. Bear with me, Integrated Pest Management, or IPM, is a long-term pest management system that uses all suitable techniques for the prevention or suppression of pests that are harmful to the health, function, or aesthetic value of city-owned landscapes, buildings, and facilities in a safe, efficient, effective, and environmentally responsible manner. We can often accomplish this through accurate pest identification, frequent monitoring for pest presence and impact, applying appropriate action thresholds, and by making the habitat less conducive to pests using mechanical, cultural, physical, and biological controls. If none of these is effective, only then might we consider using an appropriate pesticide. And some of the ways that, so the steps in this would be first prevention. If we can keep areas healthy, whether they're natural areas or, or turf areas, they can better resist weeds and other pests. And one of the ways in natural areas we do that is with a lot of controlled burning. We do that in many of our natural areas. Mechanical burn, or controlled burning is also to be considered a mechanical control, as is mowing, cutting, hand pulling, and aerating turf. There are cultural controls we can turn to, selecting native species that are well suited to the environment here, attracting beneficial insects that can help keep pests away using proper irrigation techniques for turf and monitoring the weather to make sure that we're avoiding overwatering. Physical controls such as fencing or screening, uh, just a dense cover of any type of desirable vegetation can help to keep weeds out. Biological controls, you may be familiar with the Gallerocella beetles that were brought in to control purple loosestrife years ago, uh, or Bt, which is used to control gypsy moths, so those are all biological controls. We've also looked at other innovative solutions. Uh, you may have heard about our goatscaping project at Gallup Park this summer, uh, where they were put on several, several of the islands there to clear some of the brush. We've done some experimenting with a vinegar salt soap spray using a combination of those ingredients to try to kill some weeds. Uh, we've been using buckthorn baggies 
plastic bags that you can cut, put over a cut stump in, um, to keep them from re-sprouting. They work pretty well, and in someone's backyard, it could be a really good alternative. A little harder when we're dealing with uh, 1,000 acres of natural areas in the parks, but it could be a good, a good alternative in small, on small properties. If none of those work, then we start considering if there are any chemical control options that might work. Well, no matter which one of those we use, we always, uh, evaluation is an important part of that to make sure that we're going back and monitoring the situation to see if we're getting the results that we were expecting and hoping for. The golf courses use IPM as well. They have their own challenges um, that we may not have in the natural areas. The golfers have learned to expect that uh, the golf courses are going to have lush green vegetation, and um, so they're challenged with, with trying to keep our golf courses looking attractive to the golfers so they don't leave and go someplace else. But our, our golf courses, Leslie Park Golf Course and Huron Hills Golf Course, are, have much higher tolerance for weeds and turf diseases than someplace that might be 100% weed-free. They use many different cultural practices there, which uh, Scott could tell us more about if, if you have questions about any of those. But of the 650 golf courses in Michigan, only 11 of them are uh, certified by both Audubon International and the Michigan Turfgrass Environmental Stewardship Program. Leslie Park, Park Golf Course is one of those golf courses. Uh, Huron Hills Golf Course is one of only 25 that participates in the Monarch and the Rough Program, trying to make their, the rough areas of the golf course uh, friendly for pollinators like Monarchs. A case study I wanted to take you through in our world at Natural Area Preservation, or NAP, uh, is with stiltgrass. Stiltgrass is a highly aggressive invader that's been ravaging parts of the southern US, southeastern U.S., but it's just made it to the Midwest and here to Michigan a couple years ago. It first showed up just west of town three or four years ago. Um, it's very aggressive. It displaces native vegetation in our forested areas. It takes away resources for wildlife. By 2008, uh, 2018, it first reached the western edge of the city at the Botsford Preserve. Um, if left unchecked, silk grass can pretty quickly take over areas and outcompete much of the native, many of the native wildflowers. So we quickly uh, jumped on this problem and with some other local organizations formed a silk grass working group to try to put our heads together and figure out how to best approach this problem. Uh, we tried a bunch of different control efforts. Uh, we tried burning with propane torches to kill the young plants in July. That was very slow and inefficient. Prescribed fire, which we often like to turn to, doesn't work because in the spring, when we, have, when we do a lot of burning, the plants aren't up yet, and in the fall, it's too late. They've already set seed. This is an annual plant that completes its whole life cycle in one growing season, and both our spring and fall seasons would miss the window of opportunity to control those. Hand pulling is also very slow and inefficient. Mowing is definitely not effective. In fact, it spreads the plant, so that's a no-no. We considered goats, but there's no way to ensure that the goats that uh, would eat this plant, they tend to be browsers of more woody plants. This is a much smaller, shorter, herbaceous grass plant. Um, and they also might spread the deer just the way deer currently do. We considered then some chemical options, looking at grass-specific herbicides. You might think that would be a good option, but uh, that, those herbicides act too slowly. They, uh, by the time they would kill the plant, the plant would have already set seed that would be viable and they're ineffective. So then we considered maybe a, a weak solution of glyphosate, uh, Roundup, um, hoping that a weaker solution maybe wouldn't have too many effects on the non-target species. But we've run into issues with resistance there that if we don't have a strong enough solution to actually kill the plants, we're just creating more resistant, chemical resistant versions of stillgrass. So we finally settled on a, an herbicide called Scythe, which is a, is a contact herbicide. That means it's not systemic. It doesn't uh, kill the roots of the plant. It just burns the foliage. So it doesn't hurt the per any perennials that it touches at all. But on annuals, like the stilt grass, it has uh, the most effect on them. And that's proven to be the most effective and efficient method for us than any of the non-herbicide methods were. That's the kind of thought process we would go through in trying to assess how we might approach any one of our pest problems. Another example in uh, both at NAP and in within park maintenance would be how we control poison ivy. Uh, we get lots of complaints from park users about that, especially near shelters or footpaths, other areas where the public just can't avoid poison ivy. Pulling it is, of course, uh, 
not a good option, <laughs> especially if you're as sensitive as I am to it. Mm -hmm. Even in the winter, it's also can cause a rash then as well. So we eventually uh, turned to using a weak solution of glyphosate here, two to five percent solution of glyphosate applied to the vegetation with a spray bottle just to individual plants, and that is translocated to the roots where it kills the whole plants. So what herbicides do we use throughout the golf course? I will run through all the ones that we use, both in golf courses and park maintenance and at NAP, and um, probably not give you all the detail about these, but um, one of the, them here, Miramichi, is uh, an organic herbicide uh, listed by the Organic Materials Review Institute. It's a foliar spray. You'll see in these slides it says, um, there's a word in italics, either warning, danger, or caution. That's the, uh, the level of toxicity that they're rated at. This one's foliar sprayed with a backpack sprayer uh, to kill clover and dandelions in the golf courses. Altogether, we use maybe 10 gallons of that in a year throughout the park system. The golf courses also use clopyr clopyrolid, um, which was a, carries a warning, uh, a label of a warning. Also a foliar spray applied with backpack sprayers, uh, about half a gallon of that used throughout the year. Uh, throughout our parks, we don't treat most of the turf in the parks, you know, all the soccer fields and ball diamonds and such, but those few that we do rent out, and I forget how many that is or how many acres, but it's not very many, 25 maybe 25 acres within the park system. Um, only those that we rent where there's an expectation of a higher quality turf, they treat those with um, this broad spectrum or, um, herbicide. And altogether we use maybe one ounce over for each thousand square feet of that. Uh, that's on about 3.7% of all the total mode fields in the park system. At NAP, we do use some glyphosate. Uh, most of the time it's very targeted. You can see two different application methods there. One is with a glove. We first put on a chemical resistant glove and then a yellow cotton glove over top that they can spray the herbicide on and then can hand swipe individual stems of purple loose dry for some other weed stem by stem. Or we might use a sponge applicator like you see on the right, that long white tube where we're dabbing that on cut stumps of buckthorn, honeysuckle, other woody invasives like that. Altogether, between park and uh, park maintenance and nap, we use maybe seven gallons of glyphosate um, to concentrate across the park system every year. We also use the scythe that I mentioned to treat the silk grass. Typically, about a half a gallon of that is what we've used in the last few years. Uh, we also use, again, on some cut stumps, um, some type of triclopyr, maybe Garlon 3A. Uh, it's a little bit higher danger rating uh, than than Garlon, or than um, Roundup. And we just, you know, on a bigger woody stem, you can see we can just apply it to the outer edge of that. We don't need to treat the heartwood of the plant, just that outer cambium layer that's the living tissue. We use maybe five gallons of that every year. And Mazapir is another one that uh, these different herbicides work better on certain, certain weeds. And so this one works best on Japanese knotweed, which is a big problem for us. We use about a, um, if we're cutting about a 2% active ingredient solution, or if we're spot treating uh, just a 0.75% active ingredient solution, and we use less than 10 ounces of that every year, so not much at all. So in closing, uh, we think IPM keeps our parks safe and beautiful and our nature areas native, diverse, and healthy. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay. Dave, thank you so much. I don't have questions. Stephen. Uh, Thanks for all the efforts to minimize the use of chemicals in the parks. I'm just curious on those terms like limited occasions that you have to use chemicals. Yeah. Um, are there efforts to, to inform the park users that that's going on? And, and if so, what are those? Sure. On that? I'll invite Mike up here to supplement what I'm going to say. But yeah, we're required by council resolution from years ago to do some signage and notification. I'll let Mike, Michael Hahn, who's a NAP specialist, tell us how they do that. Um, so we're Step required. Up. <clears throat> we're required to uh, post at a minimum 10 by 14 inch signs that have to that are required to be bright yellow. Uh, they're required to uh, say the herbicide that was applied, the plant that we applied it to, the toxicity rating of the herbicide we used, and um, the date. The date. The date. <laughs> um, so just to inform people, 
what, uh, what we applied and where. Um, and then that's supposed to be posted for 48 hours. So that's how we notify people that uh, there has been an application within that area. Um, just off of all the herbicides that we use at NAP, uh, re-entry per the label is once the product is dry. So the 48 hours of application is well beyond the, the time when the label says it's okay to re-enter that area. And we, I'll add that um, there also is a city list as well as a state list. If you want to be on a notification list, uh, if we apply herbicides within a certain distance of your residence, we could notify you. There aren't, uh, most of the time, uh, people don't live close enough to the areas that NAP is doing them. Uh, but, there's, but there are a few people that, with, that are on those lists, so if you want to be contacted, you could do that as well. Uh, thanks for reducing the amount. I know some of those on that list are like the Cambrian stuff are kind of they kind of have a bad reputation, right? Like they're pretty uh, aggressive chemi chemistry. Is that? I guess so? it depends who you talk to. Some okay. of these have bad reputations amongst folks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm just I know a lot of people have asked me about it, and I we got back and said as little as possible. You know, is what's being used, and it seems like you're trying to reduce it even more, right? So, sure. Um, hey, what's do removal? What's do we move Scott, Scott, that's your question. <laughs> Thanks for I mean, asking. I, I, it's kind of self-evident, but just how do you do that? Um, so the dew removal, um, there's a specific fungal disease on grass called dollar spot. Um, and it needs uh, specific things, in, especially high humidity and, and a lot of water dew on, on the grass. And it needs it for a certain amount of time, um, 12 to 14 hours, I believe. So you get that in the summer, you get the dew starting at night and it just sits there all night and then late into the morning there's still dew there. So at the golf course what we'll do is um, we would take around a couple of golf carts and drag a rope around and it would knock the dew off of the grass plant. Um, and then it would, that basically disrupts the, the time that the fungus has to uh, infect the plant and so you get a lot less dollar spot. Is that across. like fairways or greens or? Mostly fairways because greens are usually mowed or rolled um, every morning okay. so that that effectively knocks the dew off of those. Tees mowed three to four times a week so um, usually it's on fairways that we're not mowing that day. It just it helps uh, lessen the amount of dollar spot which is a pretty prevalent disease um, on golf courses uh, in the state of Michigan, the high right. humidities we have. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Interesting. Interesting. Other questions? Scott, didn't you mention at another time that that's gallons and gallons of herbicide that you don't have to use as a result of that cultural practice? Yeah, so if you look at the amount of fairways we have at Leslie Park, I think it's about 22 acres, which is about the same amount that we have in the total, like, uh, so the, so the soccer fields at Fuller, the soccer fields at Olson, the baseball softball fields at Vets, Southeast, and um, West. West. So just on the one golf course, we've got the same amount of area as all of those mm -hmm. spots um, that we're not really not treating uh, with fungicide at all. That um, other golf courses in the state are, are doing that. One more thing, which sure. good. So, you know, I'm always sad for the clover and the dandelions, but that's because sort of like it's part of the game. Like you can't be losing your ball and all the tufts, and then 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 once those take once those come in, like the gra turf grass effectively is driven out, right? You can't maintain that spot anymore. Or what what is it with the, you know? I well, can, it, so there's kind of a level of expectation for the player at the golf course. When you hit the ball, if it goes in the fairway, there's an expectation that you're going to get kind of a good lie, like, like a fair lie. Right? right, exactly. If you don't hit it in the fairway and you hit it in the rough, you're going to find clover, you're going to find the dandelions. At Leslie Park, there's a lot of other courses. If you go to a country club, you won't see them there. But um, that's, I think, the way that we try to uh, balance the need between the golfer and the environment there. Uh, you made a, mentioned a statistic about, um, I believe it was Leslie is one of 11 courses. I just want to make sure I actually capture that remark because it seemed remarkable. So what, mm -hmm. what was that statistic? Uh, 11 courses in the state of Michigan are certified with both the Audubon International 
Cooperative Sanctuary Program for Golf Courses and the Michigan State Turfgrass Environmental Stewardship Program. And that's there are two separate programs okay. that um, are uh, kind of meant to be uh, environmental uh, well, stewardship programs. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and the Audubon is a worldwide program. The Michigan one is obviously for the state. Um, but yeah, there are only 11 courses that are certified in both, and Leslie is one. And then What's the total population of golf courses again? 600? 650 around. It used to be around about yep. 800, but it's really fallen off. Um, Dave mentioned the Monarchs in the Rough. Um, he mentioned Huron Hills, but I believe Leslie Park is also a member of yep. that. So there are 25 courses in Michigan that are in part of that program, and two of them are ours. Cool. Thank you. Great. Provina. Um Thank you very much. I actually, um, I, I do marketing, so I was thinking I would love for those stats for the, for the golf course and then the work that you're doing to reduce chemicals uh, in our parks to be somehow in our social media or try to promote that to let our yeah, I community think know about it. Yeah, we're talking about ways that we can better do that, and I meant to mention the story that uh, Victor, who is not here tonight, tells the story of being at Huron Hills and having some of the golfers come in and we're getting calls from other golf courses who, whose uh, players had come and played at Huron Hills and then gone to their golf courses and we're asking them why weren't they in the Monarchs in the Rough program. So he's getting, we're, getting, we're getting word out to people that way as well. But yeah, I think we're looking for ways that we can better market this and um, make this information available to other golf courses but the public as well if they might have questions about how they can use IPM at their own, on their own residence. Um, I know you made this similar presentation to the Environmental Commission. Yes. And I believe there's a resolution they passed on that. So I was wondering if, Mike, you could share some of the thoughts from the Environmental Commission. Uh, uh, or yeah. what the intent of the resolution was, perhaps? Um, the intent of the resolution is a little bit foggy. Um, it seems like uh, the petitioners that brought the resolution forward were uh, upset about the use of lawn chemicals on private property. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of back and forth at the Environmental Commission meeting about what exactly this resolution was uh, supposed to entail, and it still seemed to be a little bit murky to me. Um, by the time that resolution came out. Uh, it seemed like there is a lot of opportunity to be able to promote uh, lower chemical use on lawns. Um, I'm not sure that this resolution necessarily captured uh, how what we do in this town could uh, promote leadership. Um, there are also, as we, as we talked about this in various committees, there are also very few levers that we have at the local level to be able to stop people from using herbicides, pesticides on their private properties. Um, so what ended up coming up out of this was uh, basically a way for uh, parks to be able to continue to promote the IPM approach that they've already done a lot of work on to the public. Um, and that was, that was really the, uh, that was sort of the, the bare bones that came out of that. Um, and it, my question to all of you was uh, how that was going to be funded as well. Mm -hmm. um, because one of the questions that came up, uh, you know, the, uh, the line that we usually see when we uh, explore these resolutions that says, well, what is the funding impact? Just said minimal. Um, so. It'd be really interesting for us to know, and I'm sure for council to know exactly where that minimal level of funding was coming from, whether it was coming out of the Nat Millage, whether it was coming out mm -hmm. of the Parks General Fund budget, um, because there are some good opportunities for outreach here. Um, I personally recused myself from uh, the uh, legislation because I'm in the lawn reduction business myself. So I didn't really see it as appropriate for me to vote on a uh, ordinance that promoted lawn reduction, even though that was written in the actual ordinance. So uh, I think this, uh, for those of you that are on council, there are plenty of opportunities for improvement as this one moves forward. 
Um, and I think there's opportunities also for the public to be able to step in here and look at ways that there could be a, uh, you know, a potential for uh, certification for a chemical-free lawn, for instance. Some sort of a positive way to be able to say, hey, the dandelions in your lawn are okay. Um, the way that this resolution sort of came about was more, uh, hey, your really green lawn is, you know, not okay, as opposed to uh, the inverse. So that is a little bit of a long answer, but uh, it, it sort of gives you the full spirit of the uh, rather uh, rowdy uh, environmental commission meeting and discussion that happened uh, well, thank as you a result. For updating. Sure, I sure. To to yeah, just uh, to speak to the budget kind of aspect of it, when we talked to the environmental commission, uh, I suppose the first time before they passed the resolution at the following meeting. One of the things that I certainly heard out of it, which I think is an opportunity for parks, is that as uh, has been kind of spoken about here today, it's an opportunity for us to educate the public with what we are doing and to actually get out in front of the ball a little bit because what usually happens every year is there will be a couple of questions from a couple of constituents that are concerned because they've seen a park has been sprayed or kind of a portion of a park has been sprayed and then we're always kind of, uh, responding to the crisis instead of explaining at the outset a little bit better kind of what we're doing. I think there's stories that we can tell that will be a very small impact on the budget. It can, it can be things like uh, social media awareness when we do um, events to just even having the information in a uh, format that we can share with people through email and otherwise. It's all information that we have and that because of the Environmental Commission and the questions they've asked, we've kind of begun to collate it and we have it in a way that I think is more kind of accessible to the public than it was before. So. Good. Yes, well, we could ask straight up, can you ban the use of these things in the city? And of course we can't. But you know, we did the thing with the coal tar with the driveway ceiling because those people have to be licensed, right? by the city to, to be an applicator of that product. So it was easy for us in that case to put a restriction on the type of chemistry that they were allowed to use, uh, you know, for the, the river's purposes. Uh, it's unfortunate that we can't kind of do the same for the, the private homeowner. I'm sure that our insect population would be much better off if we could. Um, but I see hundreds of gallons of that stuff flying out of the hardware stores, and it's really disappointing. Uh, hopefully we can get some education around it. So I have a question, I think maybe for Dave um, and your team. How do you find out about new invasives coming to the area? Thinking about the stilt grass as the example. Yeah. Is it your team walking the natural areas or is it reports from citizens? Or how does that, how do you find out about yeah. new invasives that you need it's to pay It's a combination thereof. You know, there's, we're out all the time working in the park, so we are always keep an eye out for things. Um, we don't have that many new ones that show up very often. You know, we're, most of the time we're dealing with the, the usual suspects buckthorn, honeysuckle, uh, garlic mustard, and spotted knapweed, and some of those things. So I think this one actually we first heard about because it, it first landed a couple miles west of town. We heard about it from some private citizens who, are at, who were aware of it and uh, brought it to our attention. We actually went out and to see what it was and get some first-hand experience and knowledge of what it was so we could learn to spot it in the field. Um, and then they happened to be the ones who were out in one of our parks and found it for us. So combination of, of the public finding it and us seeing it ourselves out there. Yeah. How's the, how's the uh, Japanese knotweed situation? How's the knotweed situation, Mike? We're making progress on it. Um, yeah. a lot I of know these, Cloverdale has a bunch. And yeah. For a lot of these things, you know, we, like with stiltgrass, I'll just make a comment here, then I'll let Mike talk. We've, we caught stiltgrass right away and we thought, oh, maybe we can eradicate this. And pretty quickly, once we started inventorying it, realized we can't eradicate it. Now it's just a matter of containing it. And I think with many of these things, it's a matter of picking the highest quality areas and making sure that we get it out of there and keep it from spreading to other spots. That's our general answer. Mike, how's, how's the knotweed looking? Generally, that's how we approach our approaches. <laughs> uh, for knotweed, it's something that when we find it within a park or within a natural area, we try and dress it relatively quickly. Um, just so, because knotweed is pretty aggressive, um, tends to stick around for a long time. Um, so we do like to get on top of it as quickly as we can. Um, I would say overall of the known populations, they're pretty small um, and pretty, uh, I, pretty well under control. Um, at least we're addressing them as much as we can. I, 
of the since the five years I've been here, I've had one population disappear. We're just waiting for it to come back. But <laughs> any other questions? Great. Well, thank you all for coming. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Moving on to item seven, reports. Report from the Parks and Recreation Manager, Colin. So the report is attached to your packet, um, but there's just a couple things I'll highlight for today. Um, outdoor ice rinks are still a non-starter, as you might imagine. We have a little cold weather and then a lot of weather above 30, above the freezing point, and it really takes a while to set them up. We continue to monitor it, but it's not looking very good for this particular season at the moment. Um, then speaking about that, we're uh, starting to already, um, we're starting to get into spring hiring and thinking about the jobs that we need to post and updating things there. So it is uh, surprisingly coming up quickly, it feels like. Um, I would say for the winter, the park operations staff, because we haven't had a whole lot of snow, they've been able to spend some more time working at the recreation facilities, doing repairs and updates there. So that is, is good. Um, we are in kind of the final stretch towards hiring the landscape architect. You guys will remember that as a part of the budget for this year, we added one in there. Um, I think we had some really good candidates, good interviews and we're just waiting uh, for, I guess, the last steps for the background check. We should have somebody on pretty soon, and we're excited about adding that person to the team. Um, that's it. Great, yeah. thank you. Any questions for Colin? All right, item 7B, report from Recreation Advisory Commission. Ruth. Uh, <clears throat> at the last meeting, the. Um, the big news was that the bond passed, and um, there will be some subcommittees put together that will be looking at uh, different things, including uh, work on the new environmental ed center that's going to be on the far eastern side of uh, the school's work goal, like the Wind Montessori was. Forget, I'm forgetting the name of the school. For the Freeman School, thank you. Uh, yeah, I know what goes around comes around, right? So, um, so that was one thing. Um, both summer camp and uh, after school programming is up at re at recreation right now, and that's about it. Great. Any questions for Ruth? Okay. Thank you. 7C, we do not have any other reports. Um, item 8, new business. Our first resolution is a resolution to recommend approval of a contract with Stantec Consulting Michigan, Inc. to provide lighting design services for the Ann Arbor Skate Park in the amount of $38,913. And Hillary is here to tell us more. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so the skate park is a very popular and well used year round park amenity. Um, the Skate Park Advisory Commission has recommended that lighting be added to the skate park in order ex to extend its use into the evening um, in order to allow skateboarding to safely occur year round um, during regular park hours. So regular park hours 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. nearby adjacent ball fields are lit. So just kind of extending that to the skate park. Um, and for this contract, funding's available in the park's millage. The Friends of the Ann Arbor Skate Park have also started to raise funds to contribute to the installation of the park lighting. Um, as mentioned in the memo, we also have funding available in the park's millage through the um, park's equity and fairness resolution. Um, we also intend to apply for a grant um, to help fund the installation. So again, this contract's just covering design at this standpoint, and then we'll be moving forward with installation after that occurs. Um, skate parks can be very challenging to light properly. There's a lot of curved surfaces. It's a fast, multi-directional sport. So for us, it was really important to find a consultant that had experience working on skate parks specifically. Um, we're also interested in having a consultant look at sustainable lighting practices. So conserving energy, uh, minimizing light pollution, complying with the Dark Skies Initiative, and also um, exploring renewable energy sources as a possible power option. 
So in December, the city received five proposals um, in response to requests for proposals. A selection team consisting of city park staff and skate park advisory commission members reviewed those. We ranked and determined which firms were most qualified to perform the needed services. And then fee proposals were um, open for the two top highest scoring uh, firms. And so based on the fee proposals, um, park staff and the Skate Park Advisory Commission determined that Stantec was the best firm, um, best suited to work on this project. So um, please let me know if you have any questions. We have a member of Skate Park Advisory um, Commission with us as well, so. Great, thanks Hillary. Mm -hmm. Steven, question? Just want to be clear what we're coming out with will be I guess community some community engagement to figure out exactly what the design might look like and then the actual design that we can then take for construction bids is that the correct the yeah way? yep it, so it'll be coming up with a concept design moving that through the construction document process and then this firm will also help us with overseeing construction to make sure it's all done according to the plans and specifications yeah. one more question yeah. mm -hmm. I guess, how, what was, how big was the delta between Stantec and whoever was second place? I mean, was it a clear winner or was it kind of a close? Yeah, the, um, the second firm, um, again, they were ranked very closely um, when just reviewing the proposal. The second firm was about 50% higher um, than Stantec. Okay. And Stantec was willing to even work with us and negotiate down a little bit further. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks. Other questions? Yes. Uh, just a comment. I'm excited to take this back to the Environmental Commission and say, hey, you know, there were sustainability and dark sky initiatives already included in this. So yeah. they will be very happy to hear that. Great, excellent. It's nice that that's becoming part of the city's culture. Mm -hmm. Very good, Ms. Provina. Uh, what is the timeline we are thinking for decision, implement, planning, implementation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I mentioned we are planning to apply for a grant to um, fund the installation. So we're trying to get a concept design completed before grant applications are due at the beginning of April. Um, because the grant funding timeline takes about a year from um, when they're reviewed to when you find out if you get anything, installation wouldn't occur until a following year after that in, in hopes of getting funding. Um, so design would occur this spring and then installation would likely occur um, next summer. Mm -hmm. Great. Other questions or comments? Is there a motion to approve? Motion by Provina. Seconded by Mike. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Great. The resolution passes. Thanks. Thank you, Hillary. Item 8B, resolution to recommend approval of the Riverside Park parking lot land lease with the University of Michigan. And Josh is here to tell us more. Hello, how are you? Um, in front of you is a re resolution to um, do the lease with University of Michigan for the Riverside um, Park parking lot. Um, it is 18, 18 spots along Canal Street behind Kellogg Center, between Kellogg Center and Riverside Park. It is for the hours of Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, when the park is not regularly used. Um, all over evening and weekends, it is for city use. Um, this has been a lease that we've been utilizing for roughly 10 plus years, um, and it's back up for another go around. So, um, questions? Great. Questions or comments for Josh? Is there a motion to approve? Second. Motion by Bob. Second. I second. Uh, seconded by Lauren. Okay. Sorry, Rachel. I'll get you okay. <laughs> seconded by Lauren. <laughs> Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, great. Resolution passes. Thank you. Item nine, land acquisition matters. Uh, we will be moving into the council workroom to discuss LAC, and then we will return out here again afterwards. So um, if you happen to be here for a class or school, I'm happy to sign your um, form now so that you don't have to come back. There's no form. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. <laughs>
from our land acquisition committee meeting. Uh, we did have one agenda item to discuss, and I'd like to invite Ruth to read that. I'm going to move that we recommend that City Council accept the donation of the property identified in application ID 2018-08 for parkland subject to satisfactory results from appropriate due diligence, including title work, environmental assessment, and survey. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion by Ruth. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Stephen. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Great. Thank you. The motion carries. Um, item 10, second public comment. Seeing no members of the public, move on to item 11, communications, which are included in your packet. Item 12, there's no need for another closed session. So item 13, we stand adjourned at 514. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.